Fail Forward Live. My name is Michelle Reguse McBean, and I am delighted to have my special guest today, Michelle Accardi, who is President and Chief Revenue Officer of Sardasar, a Sangoma company, and my dear friend. Welcome, Michelle. How are you? Thanks so much, Michelle. I'm great. Uh, it's just great to be on your program. Great. Thank you so much for joining. So the premise of our program, for anyone who's never heard it, is the ability to us to go into inside look of all of those people that have been hugely successful, but to understand the behind the scenes stories. What were some of the stumbling blocks and lessons learned along the way? And you're one of those people that I've admired for a long time in your career, personally and professionally. So for anyone who doesn't know who Star to Star is, can you please tell them a little bit about your company and, and what you stand for? Absolutely. So Star to Star is a unified communications as a service company, and now we've joined forces with Sangoma. So we are the broadest provider of solutions uh, in the communications and cloud services space. So we do everything from on-premise communications, hybrid communications, SD-WAN, uh, and cloud communications, as well as offering services like desktop as a service, so the ability to bring your applications that are, aren't in the cloud today and put them in a cloud uh, securely and then add communications and collaborations to those solutions. I love it, I love it. And you have an amazing company, an amazing team. Uh, and I've loved actually working with some of your team recently. And my question to you is this, did you always know that you wanted to work in technology? Oh, no, I had no idea I wanted to work in technology. Uh, in fact, it wasn't something that was ever really on my radar screen. Uh, when I graduated from college, I had a degree in political science, but I really wanted to be an actress. Uh, so I moved to New York to be an actress uh, and uh, realized very quickly what a hard lifestyle <laughs> Uh, that is, and moved back to Florida um, with the intention of going to law school and uh, had really wise parents who told me to get a job. And I found my way uh, into a technology company uh, that was gracious enough to take me in and use my ambition and eagerness. Uh, and I took some really good advice from someone who told me not to become an attorney, but to learn technology and learn marketing specifically which I went back and got an MBA in and while I worked and learned. And uh, that was really how I got my start in technology. I love it. So let's rewind a little bit further. What was your very first job and what did it teach you? Well, my very first job, I was 12 years old uh, and I worked for a Chinese uh, restaurant uh, and I was the bus busser. Uh, for that restaurant. And I learned a lot about communication styles. I learned a lot about customer service, um, it, you know, it, and a lot of how I got paid was, believe it or not, via tips, because I had to get tipped out by the servers for how much I helped them. So buttering up to them. Uh, <laughs> and, and also I had to learn really great communication because my employer, um, while he spoke English, a lot of his family did not. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of um, nonverbal communication and showing what do I need. Uh, uh, so it was really, really great experience to learn uh, to work with people in different cultures. And, and as I said, just working in the service industry, in the hospitality and, and restaurant industry will always teach you a lot. I spent a lot of my teen years working in different areas of the restaurant business. I did as well. And I would agree. I waitressed, I think, through seven years of high school and college. And uh, I'd always find the restaurants I liked the most so I could get free food when I was a struggling artist, I called it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was like, maybe this puts the salesperson in me. I always liked the cash at the end of the, at the, end of the shift in tips. Likewise. <laughs> I love it. And likewise, it, it helps me. One, it taught me humility. It taught me good customer experience like yourself, right? The ability, you can have a table of 10 people and each of them have different needs and requests and, and ways that they want to be um, treated 
and served. And, you know, so that is the balancing act. I think that is a great foundation for any sales role in the future. Now, going forward, um, what advice would you have given young Michelle at 21 years old as she was about to embark on life? You know, I think the the advice that I w- wish someone would have given was to have more confidence in my abilities and my capabilities, and to do something entrepreneurial. Uh, I, I that if I if I have a regret in life, it's that I didn't take an entrepreneurial path uh, because I believe that there's a lot that uh, you can create for yourself in terms of wealth and opportunity, but it's easier to do when you're young than it is to do when you're older, when you don't have all the responsibilities. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No, I would say that there's a level of, I think it's a double-edged sword, right? Because when you're young, you have all the confidence and none of the responsibilities. When you're older, you have all the experience and all of the effort and work that comes in. (laughs) And especially for you, I believe if I'm counting correctly, you have six children. Is that close? That's correct. Six children. (laughs) Yes, that's that's amazing. And so we had a wonderful um, chat on your upcoming podcast about work-life balance. So I'll just give a little teaser here. Do you think work-life balance is a myth? Pretty much. (laughs) I believe, you know, work-life integration is uh, really more of what we can strive for. Uh, You know, I don't find a, a huge amount of balance in my life, but I find a huge amount of opportunity to integrate the two things together um, and to tell people and not to be afraid to tell people, um, hey, if you need me to prioritize something for you, like in my personal life, I have to tell my husband, like, hey, don't forget to tell me that the kids have something going on today that I got to be at. Um, make sure it gets on my calendar because I won't necessarily remember. And the same thing for work. Um, I, I, have to set those boundaries at work because I could I'm the type of person who will get on my my phone and start working uh you know at six o'clock in the morning and sometimes look up and it's nine o'clock at night and I'm still working so um I have to set those boundaries for my (laughs) (laughs) yeah then too yes absolutely when do you sleep is the question with all of the <laughs> you you're like uh, the british you know trainer. not I, I don't i don't get enough and that's and that's a problem honestly you know i'm still i'm still working at you know how to get to this work life I, again I, I for me it's a myth work life balance i think it's important i think um you know but it's all about people's choices and about and that that choice comes to who you cha- choose to have who you choose to have in your life as a partner or support system and how you're able to communicate with them about their needs and your needs. It's about doing the same with your, with your work. Um, You know, no one I think sets out as a manager or a leader in a business and says, boy, how can I upset my employees today? (laughs) Right. How can I work them to death? I don't think any of us, you know, set out that way, but things need to get accomplished and you ask things of your staff, And if you don't know that they have other personal commitments, um, it, it can be a challenge. So my best advice, and and again, maybe it's easy for me because I was raised in a big Italian family where we were pretty direct with one another. Tell people if you need off on a certain day or you have certain commitment, you're, you know, tell, tell your manager, talk about the challenges that you've got on a personal level and see how you can work together and come up with a work-life integration that's going to work for you and work for your business. And guess what? If it's not going to work for your business, then you're in the wrong place. Go find some place that will work for you. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I think that too often people feel like they're stuck and there's no other options, but there's always other options. Uh, you just have to seek them out. I love that. I think that's great advice. And I think that uh, I was listening to um, a TED Talk this morning. I went on a run. I had one of those, I went to bed late nights, but I couldn't sleep when I woke up. And then I just said, you know, I'm just tossing and turning. Let me go for a run. And the woman was talking about um, the key to happiness. And she said the story about writing your own narrative. 
And this woman wrote a letter to her and she's a therapist, but she calls herself an editor and she helps people edit their lives. And she said she felt trapped. And there was this analogy she used with somebody behind a cage, but the door, there was no doors on either side. So sometimes we put ourselves in our own predicaments where we are feeling trapped or feeling um, in a way that is not ideal for us personally or professionally. And absolutely, I love the idea of leaning in to figuring out what makes you happy and what your path is. So for you, as you went on your journey throughout, you know, technology, working at CA and getting into the, your current role, how did you advance in careers? Did you um, have mentors that helped you on your journey? Oh, so many. I, I, I'm really lucky. I had, you know, early in my career, uh, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Norm Worthington. He started a company called Infresco that I worked for when I was, again, 20. When I moved back from New York from being an actress, and he took a chance on me uh, again, uh, and I learned a lot. Uh, through working with him and his company at that point. And then when CA acquired that company, uh, I was really lucky to meet a lot of fabulous people, but a gentleman by the name of George Fisher, who uh, became the chief sales officer of CA, who I really, uh, you know, worked very, very closely with over 15 years of my career at CA, and he acted as a mentor. And he introduced me to some other women who were incredible mentors to me, um, people like Joanne Moretti. Uh, and Joanne uh, really helped me. You know, there's something that a male mentor can bring to you, but there's a, something, a whole different variety of information that having a, a female mentor who's strong, but understands the challenges that a woman coming up through leadership and how you're perceived, um, that, she, that she really helped me with. Um, and, you know, I, I'll also say, you know, my parents were mentors to me. Um, you know, they had a strong uh, personal relationship uh, and, you know, watching them and having them as a sounding board as I made my decisions about uh, making a change from going from a multi-billion dollar company into a startup environment, which uh, was more of where Start a Star was when I started with it, um, having their sounding board and support was also very helpful. Okay, great. Well, my next question for you, Michelle, I mean, you have been wildly successful in everything you do. You have ambition, drive, passion, but I'm sure you've had some failures along the way. So would you mind sharing with our audience, what was your biggest failure and what did it teach you and why? Failure, I feel it's personal, not professional but I think it had impact on my, on my professional life. Uh, I married the wrong person and I got divorced. So I find my, my divorce to be the biggest failure that I had. Um, and again, I went into it without doing it for the right reasons. Um, you know, I was, uh, this takes a little bit of a personal story, but I had been with someone in my twenties for many years and he was in an accident and broke his neck and uh, that relationship unfortunately oh, wow. never proceeded so when that i was a month away from my from getting married when that happened um and so uh wow. i was 29 and i was feeling despondent that i hadn't you know i'm you know i'm i'm gonna be an old maid 29 you know not going to get married, not going to have children. Oh, gosh. You you know, this, these are the stories <laughs> that I told myself. Um, and by the way, no one right. else was telling me that story. This was the story in my head. Um, so I moved from New York to Florida to right. be close to my family. And, you know, and, and about nine months later, I met, I met a guy who looked great on paper, you know, and, and, and in person, handsome guy, had a good job. He, uh, you know, he checked all the boxes. Um, but ultimately, we had very different visions uh, for our lives. Some, some people think, oh, you know, getting involved with someone who's a business person and travels a lot sounds really si exciting and sexy. Well, it's exciting and sexy for the first six mm -hmm. months. And then when, when you realize three days right. a week or four days a week, your spouse isn't there um, because they're off doing deals. Right. <laughs> 
um, it can be very challenging. And, you know, I think, uh, unfortunately, my husband, while he intellectually knew that that was what I did for a living, he, you know, he hadn't internalized that. And I hadn't internalized what it meant for him and his needs. And we really were not compatible. Um, and I tried really, really hard right. for seven years to, you know, like my parents I had a 51 year marriage. So I expected, you know, I'm going to make this thing work. And the reality was I couldn't make it work. And I, I wasted a lot of time, a lot of his time, a lot of my time where we both could have probably gotten on with what we really did want in life. Uh, and so I see that as my, bur my, mm. my failure it, and it helped, it, it held me back from taking on opportunities, um, that I wanted to take on because again, my partner in life didn't really want those things at the time. Um, I'm happy to say that, you know, right. he's done well since we've gotten divorced and, you know, I found somebody who really supports more of the vision of the life, uh, that I want. And, uh, and so I wish I didn't make the mistake in the first place to get married to the wrong person because I thought I had to be on some timeline or I thought I had to fit someone else's vision of what a, a life looks like. Yeah. Um, if I wish I would have trusted my own knowledge that I was good enough and I didn't have to wait, whether I could wait. Um, and I didn't need to just find someone because I was at a certain age and in a certain place in my career where I thought, you know, being married with kids would somehow uh, fulfill me. Right. And what's so beautiful about this story is that you ended up finding your high school sweetheart. I did. I is did. Right? So uh, I, I remarried uh, when I was 40 um, and I married a guy who had three children, three great girls, um, and was very, very thankful that you know, he had a, uh, uh, he had an ex-wife who was a really nice, sweet girl. Unfortunately, about eight months after we got married, his ex-wife died. So I became, I, I became mom right away to, uh, three, uh, teenage girls and, uh, also took them on, Which we all know yeah, so yeah, <laughs> also took on a, uh, a, a Unfortunately, his, his ex-wife also had a, a, a child uh, from a, another relationship, took custody of that child as well. And uh, another nine months later, I got a phone call asking me to adopt twin boys. So my family grew from zero to six children in five years <laughs> that span in ages of two and a half to 24. But, um, you know, so what, what family is defined as, uh, I think, you know, we can be very varied, um, but the love is there. It's the same, whether it's biological or step or adoption or foster. Uh, and I, I just feel very, very fortunate though, to be with someone who supports all my life goals and also supports the idea that we want to bring all this love into our family. And we integrate it as best we can <laughs> to uh, to work and home life. I love it. Yes, I mean, I think it's incredible. I think your story, you know, I'm a believer that everything happens for a reason. And sometimes in life, um, you know, I wouldn't be married to Jay and have my two little girls if his first marriage didn't work out either. So, you know, sometimes I think the failures bring you closer to where you have to be. And although we wish it was different timing or different expectations, everything teaches us and leads us on a path or a journey towards something that we're meant to be on. And that's just my belief system. But I, I'm, I love hearing your story and I love hearing how you inspire your own children and lead by example in so many ways. I had the pleasure of meeting one of your daughters who's starting to look for work and seeing, um, how much she admires you through her eyes and, and what her journey is going to look like and her accomplishments. And that's such an, a very powerful thing for women and girls, whether they're your own children or you're mentoring them as well. And that obviously is something you and I are very passionate about. You recently kicked off a really great women in tech cast on your um, Head in the Clouds podcast for Star to Star, which I love. I've been listening to all of them with 
Joanne Moretti and Patty Grimm and and all of the ones that you've had so far. And I'm looking forward to hearing them as you continue and hoping yeah. you don't stop because I enjoy them so much. For you, my question is, why are you so passionate about helping women in technology? Well, look, I never even knew that technology was an option for me. And I know that that sounds funny uh, mm -hmm. to now be president of a, te a technology company and uh, to say that when I started, I didn't even know that that was an option. So I think it's really important to make sure that women know all the options that they have to them. Because I think we're oftentimes presented with what we know based on what our familial unit does, uh, right? So, you know, it's, I'm sure you've said, you heard the saying, you know, doctors beget doctors and lawyers beget lawyers. And, and I think that that goes down the chain. So I, I think it's really incumbent on people like me to make sure that women, uh, especially young women, know that careers in tech are a great option. And they're a great option if you want to be able to have work-life integration because there's so many different aspects um, of technology and working in a technology field. You know, there's, there's not just coding, right? There's product management. There's project management. There's marketing. There's sales. There's support, customer experience. All of these different opportunities uh, that... I think it's critical that women know are available to them as options uh, for, for driving a career. And I think the more um, diversity that we can bring into technology, the more real impact on people's lives we can have. Because if you only have one perspective, you're only going to build tech that reaches uh, at the needs of that one perspective. So we really need people who have experience and knowledge uh, and, and a way of thinking that can bring and open up new marketplaces for technology. So th that's why I'm passionate about it. I'm also the mother of, of three girls. Uh, so I, I'd like to also want them to be proud of me. As much as I want them uh, to be successful, I want them to be proud of me. And uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a better way to do that than trying to be a good example. I love that. I love that so much. And, and I'm sure they are. I'm certain of it. How could you not be? So I, I love your leadership here. I love your, um, your making it to the top. I think that's extremely important because it also shows your journey. And my other question is, what resources do you, do you use that give you peace or, or inspire you or um, get you like excited? Are there certain TED Talks or podcasts or videos or things that you do to unwind or relax? Just what are your resources to make you happy and whole and successful? Well, look, I, I, I'm not going to pretend I have a lot of t uh, free time, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 I certainly uh, spend time watching podcasts uh, and, and listening to podcasts uh, like you. Um, I have, I've spent a, a lot of time, um, I'll say, you, and you'll probably find this funny, but you know, I get on my teenagers' TikToks and I watch what is, I, I watch what's trending, uh, you know, from the perspective of, and some of it is totally lost on me, um, but, it's actually very helpful and enlightening is, and that might sound crazy. Um, you know, I, I, I do that with a lot of different social media platforms, uh, on Facebook, although my, my daughters will tell you that Facebook is for old people. Um, uh, you know, uh, that's like, oh, you know, you're not going to get anything out of Facebook. Uh, so if I want to understand what's going on, uh, uh, with my generation, uh, I spend my time on Facebook. Uh, if I want to understand what's going on in my daughter's generation, I spend my time on TikTok and Instagram <laughs> to get my inspiration. I love it. And I will tell you that um, I did not 
I did not buy into the TikTok thing until the global pandemic. And then I had a lot of time on my hands and it was like a black hole that would suck me in. I'd be like, I'm just going to log on, see what's happening. And, and an hour or two hours would go by. I'd be deep and I would be starting to make my own TikToks. I was the Tiger King. I was like, we're going to pause on TikTok. I, I'm not <laughs> in the stage where I make but them yet, a- but I, I have a teenage daughter um, yeah. who frankly has, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand followers um, on her TikTok, uh, wow. not, not doing things all, I'm always so happy about, but, uh, but it, it's actually, um, it, but it's actually so telling for me um, about, again, the culture uh, of that generation and, you know, what they value and how they feel valued. And I think as a marketer and as a salesperson, as an employer of those people, um, you know, it's, it's enlightening in its own realm, right? Around what, what do they think is important? Um, uh, And while, again, while I don't always agree, (laughs) uh, it it does help, I think, me to be able to, um, to relate. I, I love that. And I, I think it's really important. I think you're picking up on something that, you know, we talk a lot about. Todd Thibodeau, the CEO of Comtia, said that within the next few years that 75% of the workforce is going to be millennial and then Gen Z. And the way that they consume media, the way they choose to communicate and how they want to be um, employed or sold to or marketed to is going to vary. And as those people rise up in the ranks and position of power, it definitely has an impact on your corporate go-to market strategy as well. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I think it should. So, I, it I'm should. I mean, what I see, part. and again, I could, I could get this wrong, right? I'm an observer. I'm an outside observer to this. But, you know, what I see my kids value, and, and they're firmly in that millennial space, mm-hmm. right, is they, they value their time. A lot more than I think, uh, and, and when I mean their free time, um, you know, the the ability to have experiences. Um, so you know, a job that allows them to go do something that they hadn't wouldn't have the chance to do, um, and they, in terms of being marketed to, they don't want to be sold. They they want to see that someone else right. has experienced something, and had a good experience and that good experience um, leads them to want to try um, a solution. So I think experience management becomes so much more uh, important uh, in, in future sales processes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to the Star Star TikTok <laughs> episodes. We're going to work on those, right? I'm going to be your subscriber, awesome. number one. <laughs> so a lot of people want to be chief revenue officer or president someday. What is the biggest myth about your role that you would like to debunk for anyone who has well, not I yet think been in what, that role? Well, I think what people think is that you get to the top and that you still don't answer to someone. Um, you know, we're all answering to different mm. people. So you know, if you're CEO of a company, you're answering to your board and to your investors. Um, when you're president of a company, you're you're answering to your customers. You're answering to all your employees who are looking for the vision and strategy. Um, and, you know, you don't just get to shut that stuff off because you're always in service. If you're good at what your job is, you're always in service to someone else. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're right. aspiring to it because somehow you think it's going to make things easier for you, don't think that that's what's going to happen. It gets more complex uh, the further up the chain uh, you get. Um, and ultimately, it can be pretty lonely at the top because you don't always know if people's intentions are right um, with regards to uh, when the, when they're befriending you, right? Do they want something for you from you, or uh, you know, uh, or is it is is it uh, genuine? So uh, that that's uh, I think another big piece of you know 
getting to the top of, um, is understanding, you know, that, that, you know, it doesn't always get easier. And, uh, you know, again, you do have to think about why, you know, why people are asking for certain things uh, and be a little more discerning. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's really wise. I think that's a valuable point. And it kind of goes to your point about being sold to at any level, right? It's, it's about those genuine, authentic relationships. Those are the heart, I think, of business. And I and that's what I love, um, you know, having this conversation with you because we've been friends for years and we've built a relationship out of our friendship and admiration um, being women in tech. And I think that that's such a powerful thing is that when you can help build each other up in, in certain ways, it's very powerful. Um, but it is not always easily perceived. And there's a lot of people that I have found in my personal journey um, that they they don't always have the best intentions. And I think that that uh, long term always comes out. So always, always, uh, my mom would tell me growing up, it doesn't matter if it's the president or the janitor. You treat people Absolutely. with respect and kindness. Well, and my, my father so. used to say to me, uh, just be careful when you're climbing up that ladder that you're not, you know, you're, you're always good to, because when you, when you get, go down, back down the ladder, some of those people are going to be, uh, you know, at a different level. And, and it's true. You know, I remember when I was a 22 year old kid becoming a manager and there were some people who were in their forties or fifties who worked for me. And I, and I think to myself, oh my gosh, I hope I treated, I think I treated everyone well, but you know, but, uh, and I tell you know, I look at my girls now as they might take on managerial roles. And I think, you know, these are, this is the next generation of leaders, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's really important that you always treat everyone regardless of generation or role. Um, we come into this world the same and uh, we go out of this world <laughs> uh, the same way too. So uh, I think equal respect is really, really important. I love it. Great lessons. Great lessons from our parents. Um, my my other question to you, and we both live in Florida, and this has been a weird year or so for many people, challenging professionally and personally, obviously the global pandemic. We are getting vaccinations. People are starting to get back to work. They're starting to travel. Some some never stopped, but I was pretty restricted. I know you and your team were as well at certain points. So I'm just curious: Are you traveling, and where are you going to next for work? Well, for um, y yes, I am traveling. Um, I believe week after next, I'm going to go to New York to meet with some partners. Uh, so I'm excited about that. I've had some other travel uh, in the in the recent past as well. Went up to Boston to meet with a customer, so uh, that's all really exciting. I'm hoping I can get the rest of my family vaccinated and maybe go on a trip to Costa Rica in the not too distant future. That's my hope uh, from an international travel perspective. But uh, I'm really hoping to get out in front of all my partners uh, and even go out on a partner recruiting uh, road show. Um, by the end of the summer, uh, again, for any of those folks who are comfortable and vaccinated, like I said, I got my two Moderna vaccines. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely out there hitting the road. Me too. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, Pura Vida, I love Costa Rica. I want to see all those photos. That's going to be amazing family vacation. You have to do the zip lining <laughs> with the howler monkeys. Oh, it's just so much fun. <laughs> So my other question for you is if people want to contact you, how can they get well, a hold of you? Well, I make it really easy. Uh, you can uh, email me at M-A-C-C-A-R-D-I at startastar.com. That's Emma Cardi at startastar.com. That's an easy email. Or I'll give my phone number, 941-960-8250. Uh, Feel free to give me a call. Uh, I do answer my phone. <laughs> It'll reach me anywhere that I might be in the world, whether that's Costa Rica or New York or Sarasota, Florida. Uh, so uh, please feel free to give us, uh, give me a call, and uh, we love love to get to know you and help you. 
I love that. Find me, follow me, but we're going to give you a break. You need at least one break on your family vacation. So don't call her right now. <laughs> and for, um, if, here's our final buzz round question, Michelle. If we could switch roles and you can hop into my place and ask yourself anything I miss, what would you ask yourself? Oh, gosh. What would I ask myself? Um, I guess I would ask, would you do it all again? And uh, I would say, yes, I would do it all again. I love that. <laughs> I would do it all again. Even, you know, the struggles, the everything has taken every choice um, and every obstacle has taken me to where I am today. And I'm in a pretty beautiful place with a great company, uh, with a great family, with great friends and mentors. So uh, I'll sign off saying that, that, you know, I would do it all again. Oh, I love that. Cheers to you and your beautiful family and your amazing team. Everyone go check out Michelle Accardi. Call her, email her, visit your friends at Star to Star. They have an amazing product, an amazing team led by an amazing leader. Thank you Thank for joining you. and inspiring us all. And everyone go home and don't be scared to fail for it and live. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.